The topic of our sermon today is Escape to the Mountains. Escape to the Mountains. Genesis chapter 19 and verse 17. This is what the word of God said. So it came to pass when they had brought them outside that he said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you. No, do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest ye be destroyed. The setting of our sermon today is in the plains of Jordan, the city of Sodom, usually mentioned with Gomorrah. And as we continue with the message we will see how it can apply to us in this contemporary society. What we are now looking at, the purpose of looking at this one, the background briefly is that Abraham was called by God. And when he moved to where he was told to move to, he went together with his nephew, um, Lot. As they were staying in that place, they were very rich in livestock and all other that was necessary. And there were quarrels most of the time, especially the shepherds of Abraham, the shepherds of Lot. And Abraham gave a suggestion, nephew, instead of us quarreling, it is unnecessary, let us separate so that we reduce the quarreling. If you go east, I go west. You go south, I go north. So, they separated and the Lord chose to go to the city of Sodom. Genesis chapter 13 will give us, enable us to understand how Sodom is brought into view. What the city is this that the Lord chose? The city had a wonderful description that anyone could have admired to own a house there, be it a flat, a bungalow, or a bungalow, or a mansion, with well-trimmed fences and evergreen compounds. The city of Sodom, it was the fairest among the cities of the Jordan Valley. Her luxuriant vegetation of the tropics flourished. Here was the home of the palm tree, the olive, the vine, the flowers shed their fragrance throughout the year. Rich harvests clothed the fields. Flocks and herds covered the encircling hills. Art and the commerce contributed to enrich the broad city of the plain. The trash of the east adorned her palaces. The caravans of the desert brought their stores of precious things to supply her marts of, of trade. With little thought of labor, every want of life could be supplied. And the whole year seemed one round of festivity. So what did this fullness of life in Sodom bring, Sodom bring about? One, it gave birth to luxury and pride. Idleness and riches make the heart hard that has never been oppressed by want or burdened by sorrow. Love of pleasure was fostered by wealth and leisure. People gave themselves to sensual indulgence. The Bible confirms this further in the book of Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 49 and 50. The word of God says, Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, and abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy, and they were hot and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw fit. They are saying the picture we are getting here is what we are experiencing today in our society. The areas, for example, in Kajado County, thousands of men and women from this county of Nairobi and from others, they flock in that county. There is a place where there is a parking of over 2,000 cars. And if 
you will say every car had around three occupants times 1,000. Those fellows are 3,000. I don't know. I'm not good in mathematics. I didn't do it well in school. I could hear rumors. When teachers were teaching mathematics, to me it was rumors. So the thing is, you find these fellows have gathered there with those, their cars and everything. Their business is to eat mbuzi, goats. Goats are killed every Sunday in thousands. Men eat. So in the evening at around 6, 7, you see cars now from those areas coming. And the men say, that is life. When they talk over phone, they talk of how many mbuzi they chewed how it was at that time, and all those kind of things. Live, that they say, this is now live. There are food in Niger all over. Because of what we see, people of God, when you walk around, someone estimated one time that if we harvest five bags of maize, only two are consumed, three go in waste. And that is true. When we were young, many years back, we had never seen Mandazi. My fellow Ugandans, you know Mandazi? We had never seen Mandazi. So, mommy prepared Mandazi. And then we were wondering, what are these strange things? But we ate as children, we found, oh, they look nice. And we ate too much. We didn't know that the oil in Mandasi will swell our stomachs. So we struggled. We were competing to eat Mandasi. But our stomachs were full and we could not eat anymore. Because the Mandasi are around like those small balls, we began now kicking them like balls like this. Because we were full. The following morning, we asked the mommy, where is Mandazi? And she said, you know, yesterday was Christmas, and that was the only time you were to eat Mandazi. So we went to where we were playing to see whether the Mandazi may be available. We found the ants had eaten all our Mandazi. Now, basically what I'm putting across, that is the behavior in most of our homes in urban centers. That was exactly the problem that was in Sodom. The Bible is saying, look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, and abundance of idleness. Today we experience that. Even coming to church. At what time do we come to church? Where are we in the morning? We are in our houses. We are not doing anything. We are swiping. We are watching programs over TV. Uh, uh, trying to get the latest from wherever it is. Once we are to Meona Matanga, we have seen Matanga, so Yasatatu, Ndio Tunansa Kusema, Sasa Twende Church. When we come to church, we don't come in the church, we stand outside there with our big smartphone. You see, we have come to a point, people of God, where we say we have reached. And anyone who has reached has nothing to do with God, unfortunately, dear people of God. We come out here. We begin swiping our phones and to show we have reached, you pack your car. Then with the car keys and the big smartphone on another mukono, some carrying two and the shirts intact. Those are the people who have reached. That was the problem of Sodom. That was the problem of Sodom, people of God. They didn't care about God. They were wondering. God wondered about the lifestyle in Sodom, and they came to find out and they confirm the horrible lifestyle. Genesis chapter 18, when we get back, Genesis chapter 18, verse 20 and 21, the Bible says here, And the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and the Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done all together according to the outcry against it. That has come to me. And if not, I will know. The cities behaved, did things, wonders, until God said, now I have heard that. 
let me go down and find out what is going on there. And the God came down. For sure when he came, he confirmed, if we use a human language, God confirmed by his own eyes the strange and the horrible lifestyle that was there. The situation was in such a way that he could not allow it to proceed with that kind of lifestyle even for an hour. Sodom was judged that very night and condemned to be burned to ashes immediately without any opportunity for an appeal. Genesis 19, 24 and 25, the word of God says, Then the Lord rained brims brimstone and a fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. So he overthrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. Before God doing that, he gave Lot an opportunity to escape from God's judgment on Sodom, dear saints. In any crisis, where there is a fight between righteousness and unrighteousness, where there is a fight between light and the darkness, where there is a fight between truth and error, where there is a fight between justice and injustice, God has always had a remnant representing him. Always, in any crisis, God has always had a remnant. So, even if you look at the world today, even if you look at the church and say, the church has become corrupt, that is okay. But remember, let a crisis come, you will see the remnant of God. And in most cases, people of God, the remnant are a people on the floor. People on the wall have never stood on the remnant side. They stand only when there is peace, when they are recognized, when they are given uh, uh, big titles. That is only when those ones stand. When a crisis involving spirituality comes, it is the people on the floor who stand on the Lord's side. I do hear uh, teachers teaching our children. There is a song I, I hear, I, Kidogo. I hear them ask, which side are you standing on? Okay. Which side are you standing on? And then they say, stand, 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 stand. Then they finish by saying, standing on the Lord's side. So, when there is a crisis, God has always a remnant. In any crisis, as I've said, in the times of Noah, for example, when wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And when you analyze, Noah was not among the rich people at that time. Noah was simply ordinary. And when God said, I'm giving you an assignment, he took it up and did the assignment. In the case of Sodom, Lot, who was brought up in connection with the knowledge of God, and through the intercessory prayer of Abraham, he found the favor in the sight of God. You remember when God was going down to Sodom, he passed through Abraham's home, and then he told him his agenda, and Abraham began to intercede. And said, Lord, you are going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? He said, yes. He remembered there is my nephew there. And they began interceding. What if you get 50 people? What if you get 45? He went down all the way, five people. God said, if I get any five people, I will not destroy the city. When a problem was found in Sodom and Gomorrah, God worked out something. Genesis chapter 19 verses 12. Because of the intercessory prayer of Abraham, this is what is happening. Then the man said to Lot, have you anyone else here, son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in the city, take time, take them out of this place. 
verses 13. For we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who had married his daughters, and said, Get up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But to his sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. To his sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. Verse 15, when the morning dawned, the angels urged the Lord to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he lingered, Lord was not willing to leave Sodom. He was not. The kind of palatial home he had put up then, he said, I can't leave this. I can't. I can't. God was so merciful. Using the angels, he took hold of his hand. He took hold of his wife's hand. He took hold of the hands of his two daughters. The Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him out and they set him outside the city. So it came to pass when they had brought them outside that he said, escape for your life. Do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. Dear saints, why were they told to run to the mountains? Why run on the mountains? On the mountains was his only safety. Fiscal mountains have played a very critical role symbolically as far as salvation of mankind is concerned. On the mountains of Ararat, Noah's ark found rest during the flood, Genesis 8.4. On Mount Moriah, or Moria, is where Abraham is taught to have gone to over his son Isaac a sacrifice to Jehovah, Genesis 22. On Mount Sinai, which is also called Horeb, the Ten Commandments, which are a revelation of God's character, were given by God himself, Exodus 19 and 20. Mount Nebo, which is also Mount Pisgah, this is where Moses viewed the promised land. The same place Moses, the servant of God, died. He was buried and resurrected from that point, Deuteronomy 32 and 34. On Mount Carmel, Elijah demonstrated the importance, the importance, the uselessness, if there ever there is such a language, of Baal, and vindicated the power of Jehovah, First Kings chapter 18. Elijah seemed to have lived here on Mount Carmel for some time. On Mount Olives, Jesus the great summon on his second coming Christ, that's where he gave it. From Mount Olives, Jesus began his celebrated entry in Jerusalem. At Gethsemane, after the Lord's Supper, Jesus' sufferings began on the slopes of Mount Olives. From Mount Olives, Jesus ascended to heaven. On Mount Calvary, also called Golgotha, a place of the skull, is the most important mountain of all mountains. Why? This is where Jesus Christ was crucified. Sometimes it is claimed that Mount Moriah and Mount Calvary are identical. Why is Mount Calvary important? The act on Mount Calvary has separated us from the world. What was the act on Mount Calvary? It was the sacrificial um, service that Christ gave on behalf of humanity. So that act of Christ being sacrificed on Mount Calvary has separated us from the world. We are no longer worldlings. We are the children of God. That act on Mount Calvary has put us into God's kingdom. We were thrown out. We had chosen the devil and we were lost. But Christ's act on Mount Calvary has put us into God's kingdom. That act on Mount Calvary has introduced us to God. When we sinned, we lost it. 
and therefore God who is merciful in order again to bring us back to him an act was needed of shedding of blood which was shed on Mount Calvary. The act on Mount Calvary people of God has made us the children of God. We were not children of God but now because of the act on Mount Calvary we have been made the children of God. The act on Mount Calvary has made us hells of eternal life. We were hells of eternal destruction. But Jesus Christ's act on that mountain has made us hells of eternal life. The act on Mount Calvary has reconciled us to God. When sin came in, we were alienated from God. But that act of Jesus Christ dying on Mount Calvary, shedding his holy and innocent blood has reconciled us to God again. Reason why God told Lord, escape for your life, escape to the mountains, because there you will be saved. We are called upon to escape to the mountains and for this matter to Mount Calvary because there we have been reconciled to God. And that's why escape to the mountains, not simply to the hills. No, which mountain particularly? Mount Calvary. Because there, we are reconciled to God. Escape the act on Mount Calvary has cast Satan down. He no longer has any hope. He no longer has any kind of strength. For those of you who have killed snakes, normally a snake is hit on the head. And the moment that head is completely in pieces, there is one part of the snake that remains a bit demonstrating whether it is alive. It is the tail. You know, look, have you ever watched for those who have killed snakes? When the head is dead completely, the tail is wagging. Dear people of God, what is giving us problems in the world is not the head of the devil, it is the tail. The head is smashed. And for those of us who fear snakes, when you see even a tail, you begin running away. And yet the, the head is already dead. The devil is already dead. Escape to the mountain. Why? The snake the devil is smashed. So all we are seeing, the diseases, the whatever, that is not the head of the devil. That is simply the tail. And there is no life in the tail. Because finally, the tail will be finished forever. Who cannot run to such a mountain? This is a symbolic mountain Lot refused to run to. In Genesis chapter 19, verse 19, the Bible says here, Indeed, now your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have increased your mercy, which you have shown me by sa saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, lest some evil overtake me and I die. That's where our problem is. We accept Jesus Christ, yes. We say, Lord, thank you for giving me a second chance again. But when you are telling me, to live my lifestyle into another lifestyle, that one, Lord, it cannot work. It cannot work. And that is why we are members in the church of God, but our lifestyle is on the other side. Are you aware, people of God, that there are some of our families, in, when it comes time for prayer in the evening, they can't, they can't switch off the TV. They cannot, they cannot. For those pastors who are here, when we do visitation in some of, our home, some of our homes, when it comes time for prayer, and you find small kids that are before the TV with their whatever it is, vibonso, 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 what is vibonso? Cartoons, you know, with their cartoons. Then you say, Madam, now we want to pray. And they can say, hey, don't touch, don't touch. And then you see, you hear a mother saying, you know, Pasita, uh, that one, when he has refused, there is nothing we can do. <laughs> ah, no! <laughs> Dear people of God, Lord told God, 
God, I have found favor in your sight. But when you tell me to run to the mountain, I'm going to die. Leave me here. God is calling upon each one of us this morning. Run to the Mount Calvary where there is salvation. What is your response? And remember, when you are running to the mountain, you cannot drive to the mountain. God did not say drive to the mountain. Your V8 will not climb up the mountain. Your whatever will not climb up the mountain. Your whatever will not go. Your Volvo will not go. Your Mercedes will not go. It won't climb the mountain. The only alternative, you move out of it and dash to the mountain. If you want to drive it there, you will be lost. What am I saying? Stop worshiping vehicles and the houses and everything. You know people of God. My dear sisters and brothers from Uganda, in Kenya, there are people who have cars and others have a means of transport. So, <laughs> not everybody, not everything outside here is a car. Not. You know, for us, we may say there are cars, but to some people, Others are things, means of transport. There may be a few who have cars. And those who have cars, even if he's an elder, when he's standing here giving announcements, the car of his keys are in his hands. Allow me to say this on a very humble note. My dear elders, unless we move away, from the way we are running even the church of God. I've been to some churches all over. And then you see a badge. Kuna badges waze wanaweka makanisa mengine. And the badge says chief head elder. What I read in the Bible is chief of sinners. I have not read that one. Where do we pick these things from? The Bible speaks of chief of sinners and the Bible speaks of chief Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone who has come to save the chief of sinners. Are we willing? God convinced Lord, go. Lord said God is okay but let me remain in my status. The Bible says, verse 16, it depicts a very blinded behavior. Chapter, uh, Genesis nineteen sixteen. And while he lingered, the man took hold of his hand and the wife's hand and the hands of his two daughters, the Lord being massive to him, and they brought him out and set him outside the city. Even today, many of us don't want life. We are satisfied with the present sinful life that passes away. The spirit of prophecy says, we should beware of treating lightly God's gracious provisions for our salvation. There are Christians who say, I do not care to be saved unless my companion and the children are saved with me. They feel that heaven could not be heaven to them without the presence of those who are so dear. That is the attitude of many of us. But very unfortunately, soon, and very soon, the curtain will be drawn, and it will be forever final. The invitations of mercy are addressed to all, and because our friends reject the Savior's bleeding love, shall we also turn away? The redemption of the soul is precious. Christ has paid an infinite price of our salvation. And no one who appreciates the value of this great sacrifice or the worth of the soul will despise God's overt mercy because others choose to do so. Let us not fall a multitude in making decisions as far as salvation is concerned. 
Salvation is an individual matter. Christ made it very clear. Two people will be sleeping in one bed, a man and a wife. One will go, another one will remain. It means when we stand before the judgment seat of God, we will not stand as a couple. There is nothing you will tell God, God, let me bring my wife. Nothing like that. You stand an individual. Salvation is an individual matter. It is not a couple's matter. It's an individual matter, people of God. The very fact that others are ignoring the just claims of God should arouse us to greater diligence that we may honor God ourselves and lead all whom we can influence to accept his love. Lord's instructions to escape to the mountains are our instructions today to escape to Mount Calvary where salvation has been freely lavished to us. What were those instructions again? Verse 17 of Genesis 19. Escape for yourself. Do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. The same instructions are coming to us today. The current Sodom is about to be destroyed, never more to rise again throughout the eternal ages. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter, chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning verses 1, the word of God says, But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power and from such a people turn away. This was prophesied almost 500 years before the apostle Paul came into the scene. Who prophesied this 500 years before the prophet Isaiah? Isaiah chapter 24, verses 19 and 20, the word of God says, The earth is violently broken. The earth is split open. The earth is shaken exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall totter like a heart. Its transgression shall be heavy upon it and it will fall never to rise again. For those of us here who are here, for those my brothers and my sisters who may work, be working in certain organizations, trying to say we are wanting to put the economy in a manner that it will make sense, the word of God says it will never, never make sense. If it makes sense, God is a liar. God is not alive. We better leave church, go and drink because God is a liar. It will never come to be. God says, the world, dunia imelewa lewa kiswahili. Dunia imelewa lewa kama mvulevi. Inawaya waya kama machera. Itanguka haita inuka tena. Who are you to challenge God? Who are you? It is because people of God, we never take time with God. We take time with the philosophy. We take time with psychology. We take time with everything. And you know, the God of uh, media has come, the God of uh, uh, digital, we have gone digital. So the God of digital and the God of digital with a small g has made sure we have nothing to do with God. Allow me say this. Whereas, yes, God has given us knowledge to invent digital whatever platforms, but God is analog. Simple illustrations. How many of you ate something this morning when you were coming to church? Did you eat digitally or analogically? How did you chew? What software did you use to chew food? 
because eating is a very important component that God could have digitalized, but it remains analog. Some of your friends, God may have blessed them and they gave birth either yesterday evening or last week. Did they give birth digitally or analogically? Which software did they use to bring children out? Before we go to worship for things, dear people of God, let's come down, listen to the voice of God. This, God was not a fool. You people who come from Ushago, you know the meaning of Ushago. Ushago, that is a, a, a strange Kenyan language meaning a rural area. Ushago. Ushago, no tarmac roads. Ushago, some of, some of our Ushagos, when you go with you, your V8, in a baki, five kilometers, and you use your legs, legs which are no longer digital, that are manual. Why did God not create us with digital legs? Our legs are never stuck. And I have never seen since I was born someone standing in mud that I'm not able to move because my legs are not moving. Not a single one. But how many cars you find? Some on the road? Thousands. God is analog. Don't look down upon other people. Don't. One time, we were in a church. Then, an elder Kasema. You know, members, you must be very serious. And this thing I'm saying, I, we had put it on the wall. And then there was an old mother, and by Alichua Kingereza Kidogo, Akansa Kuangalia, the wall of the church, she began looking for the announcements in the wall. So she was asking, Where are those announcements? He said they're on the wall. Let us not be worshiping gadgets. Let us be worshiping the God of gadgets. When Christ was answering a question concerning when the eternal kingdom of God could come, he answered saying, Luke chapter 17, beginning verse 26, he answered saying, and as was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the, of the son of man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In the days of Noah, a warning was given to the entire world that a flood was coming. Only Noah and his household survived. And through that family, the world has been populated. In the time of Lot, a warning was given. And only Lot and his two daughters survived the judgment of God in Sodom, people of God. In these last days, the world has rebelled against God and is about to bring it to an end. The Bible says, Revelation chapter 18, beginning verse 1. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And they cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, that is this world, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine, of the wrath of our fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of our luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached the heaven, and the God has remembered her iniquities. Like the call to Lot in Sodom to come out and escape to the mountains for his safety, the same call is coming to us today living in the current Sodom and Babylon, to escape to Mount Calvary for our lives, 
lest we be destroyed together with the world which has no bearing. Will you, will I, heed this compelling call to come out of Babylon, to come out of Sodom and escape for our lives during this time of Jesus' intercessory prayer in the sanctuary above, this moment Christ is interceding for us. Every other time we commit sin, and God says, I want to destroy this sinner. Jesus Christ, the Son, stands and says, My Father, my Father, my Father, my blood, my blood, my blood. When the Father hears that, that's why you are seated here today. That's why I'm standing before you today. Because of that intercession of Jesus Christ. How has it been made possible on Mount Calvary? Escape to the mountains. And for this matter, Mount Calvary. Dear people of God, God bleeded with Lot and his family to the extent of holding their hands and forcefully throwing them out of the doomed city. God lovingly shouted to this lucky family, escape for your life. Do not look behind. You nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains lest you be destroyed. The same compelling call of the imminent destruction of this rotten world is coming to us down, is coming down to us today saying, come out of her, my people. Lest you share in her sins and lest you share in her plagues. As Lot was instructed to escape for his life and never look behind, the same is coming to us today. Escape for your life and do not look behind you. Look not behind you to console the world, people of God. Look not behind you to confer with the flesh and the blood, for they will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Look not behind you, even for a moment, to reflect with the complacency on those pursuits and the pleasures and the companions from which you must forever separate. Look not behind you to reason with the devil. Having once set your face toward heaven, oh, look not back on Babylon. Remember Lord's wife, who looked behind to the rotten Sodom that had come <clears throat> to her final blow. Luke 9, 62. The Bible says, but Jesus said, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom. The spirit of prophecy says, when Elisha was united with Elijah, he had trials in abundance, but in every emergency, he relied on God. He was tempted to think of the home that he had left, but to this temptation, he gave no heed. Having put his hand to the plow, he was resolved not to turn back. But through test and trial, he proved it true to his trust. Elisha pressed forward, never looked behind. The Apostle Paul, in his never looking behind the determination, says in Philippians 3, beginning verse 12, not that I have already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also held for me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press towards the goal for the price of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Lord was further compellingly instructed, escape. For your life, do not stay anywhere. The same compelling instructions as we have already seen are right upon us. Escape for your life and do not stay in the plane of your achievements in terms of education, in terms of wealthy, you know, people of God, in terms of fame, whatever it is, you know, dear saints, we have come to a point where even in the church of God, anything small, people begin now trying to praise themselves. A lot of pride. You hear people saying, for example, someone who has been serving as a deacon, and then at some point, he is given the responsibility of an elder. You find the mama saying, Pasita. You know, Mungwa Metuonikania. What is it, ma'am? Muse has been counting offerings for years. The Lord appeared yesterday. He was now ordained as an elder pastor. We are going to eat here to. to... Ah! Ay, 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 ay. That 
that you slaughter chicken because the husband has been promoted. There is no promotion in church. It is service in church. It is servant service. Several chicken lose lives because someone was ordained an elder. And someone goes round, and when you say, Brother Otieno, good morning. Shh, 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 shh. Skia, mami. I am Elder Otien. <laughs> Don't forget that they call people by titles which are not theirs. Learn to respect the servants of God. I am Elder Otien. And the Father, I am the Chief Elder of New Life Church. Make sure. Where do we get these titles, people of God? Because of such, we have said we are not running to the mountains. The wife of Lotin stayed back because she remembered those titles. How do I go a place where that title is not there? How do I go minus my freezer? How do I go minus my fridge? How do I go minus my everything I have and everything here? I can't go God. Can I go minus my beds? You know there are people who have beds and there are other 12 minutes of bed. When you have a bed which is 3 feet, others have 12 by 12. So who has a bed? And the 12 by 12 is only one person sleeping there. Who sleeps the rest of the space? Because you are occupying only one and a half inches. Who is occupying the 10 and a half inches? Those are some of the things we worship. Do not stay in the plane of your achievements. Do not stay in the plane of your above average family in comparison with those around you. You know family prestige. Do not stay in the plane of carnal security. Do not stay in the plane of your fleshy desire. Do not stay in the plane of your good resolution. Do not stay in the plane of despondency. Do not stay in the plane of unbelief. There are two voices calling you. One voice is from God. The other voice is from Sodom. The Sodom voice says to the careless and the worldly, tarry, be at ease, enjoy yourself while you can. The godly voice says, escape for your life to the mountains. The Sodom voice says, wait, be not alarmed, make yourself comfortable where you are. The godly voice says, haste, look not behind you, flee to the mountains, and for our case, Mount Calvary, lest we are forever destroyed. The Sodom voice says, Saul, take your easy, eat, drink, and be merry. The godly voice says, you fool, this night your soul may be required of you. To many, it seems like a mockery. To talk of danger especially in the postmodern world. The wonders of scientific inventions and discoveries, the wonders of technological inventions in enhancing communication through the digital platforms, through Zoom, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, WhatsApp, Messenger, the Japan flying cars to be launched in, in Africa, and the Kenya may be the first one to drive it. With all these wonderful inventions in the sight of man, it is not easy to accept any other message or ideas that we are to abandon all the achievements for the new heaven and the new earth. God's patience, people of God, will not always last. The day of grace must have an end. And with men, it is much shorter than we expect. Child of God, delay not for a more conviction of sin. Delay not for thorough discouragement and despondency. Delay not because you hope you are a Christian. Delay not because you hope you are a Christian. My dear brother, my dear sister, Christ is challenging us saying, you call me master and obey me not. You call me light and you see me not. You call me way and walk me not. You call me life and desire me not. You call me wise and follow me not. You call me fair and love me not. You call me eternal, and seek me not. You call me gracious, and trust me not. You call me noble, <coughs> Sorry. and serve me not. You call me mighty, and honor me not. You call me just, and fear me not. If I condemn you, blame me not. 
Let us escape to the mountains for our lives. It is more tolerable in the day of judgment for the cities of the plain than for those who have known the love of Christ and yet have turned away to choose the pleasure of a world of sin. You are slighting the offers of mercy. Think of the long array of figures accumulating against you and against me in the books of heaven. For there is a record kept for of the impieties of nations, of families, of individuals. God may bear along while the account goes on and the calls to repentance and offers of burden may be given. Yet a time will come when the account will be full. My brother, my sister, my father, my mother, my son, my daughter, my uncle, my aunt, my grandfather, my grandmother, my father-in-law, my mother-in-law, my brother-in-law, my sister-in-law, my grandson, my granddaughter, my pastor, my elder, my deacon, my deaconess, my Adventist men leader, my Adventist women leader, my internet coordinator, my Dolkas leader, my children ministers leader, my cradle roll leader, my kindergarten leader, my adventurous leader, my primary leader, my pathfinder leader, my early teens leader, my ambassador's leader, my youth leader, my singles leader, my treasurer, my church clerk, my choir leader, my choir member, my piano leader, my communication peer system leader, my stewardship and development leader, my education leader, my voice of prophecy, spirit of prophecy leader, my Adventist possibility ministry leader, my publishing ministry leader, my family life leader, my health ministries leader, my Sabbath school personal ministries leader, my friend, my neighbor, my online preaching facilitator, my professional colleague, my workmate, my regular lay church member, my dear visitor in attendance here today, are you willing to escape to the mountain for your life and for this matter, Mount Calvary, where eternal life has been secured for each and every one of us through the loving sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the only begotten loving son of God, George Bernard, where are those choristers beyond your feet? Song number 159 as we come to a close. George Bernard, in the song, The Old Rugged Cross, SDA Hymnal 159, has this challenge to all of us. Stanza 1. Are you there? Stanza 1. You don't have to organize those things. Just hold your songbook and sing. Forget about those things. George Bernard in the song, The Old Ragged Cross, is the hymn 159, as this challenge to all of us, stanza one. Mm -hmm. No, sing while seated.
dedication and your determination by the grace of God, raise up your hand as we join together in prayer. A gracious Father in heaven, we have no language to talk on how you have saved us from sin into that eternal life. We were condemned to die for we chose another master there was no hope at all. But because of your love that surpasses all understanding, you allowed Christ to come and die for us on the cross. And that cross was placed on Mount Calvary. From there he said it is finished, meaning the plan of salvation has now been sealed. It is permanent forever for whoever believes will never be lost, but have eternal life. Hold our feeble hands, Lord, and walk with us along the spiritual path as you lead us to that eternal home is our prayer in Jesus' name.